أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما نافعا اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه ربي اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري بحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to the Reflections on the Risale i Nur by Bed Uzzaman Said Nurzi podcast series. This is Mustafa Tuna. You can listen to the episodes of the series wherever you listen to your podcasts or at the website www.reflections-rn.org. As a reminder, you can find rough translations of the texts we are studying in the series at this website. For today's translation, go to the website, then podcasts, then the words, and then the 11th word. Today we will continue reading the 11th word. However, you may remember that we had already started this about 10 weeks ago. Then, because of the pandemic situation, we moved on to read and reflect upon the treaties on the sick. Inshallah, we are now returning to the 11th word. It would be a great idea for those uh, who had not listened to the 11th word, if the first episode of the 11th word, to go ahead and listen to it. For those who had listened to it, to refresh their memories. Uh, Inshallah, we will continue with a new section of the treatise today, but we will also read only the translation part of the first episode so that our memories can be refreshed a little bit. If you can go ahead and listen to that episode first, that would be even better. The 11th word, in my opinion, is one of the key treatises of the Risale Inur collection. It is a paradigm shifter. It gives a whole new perspective to see the world and ourselves in the world. Therefore, it is very important and at the same time, it is very beautifully written, very easy to grasp. Especially at the beginning, the beginning parts of the treatise. It begins with a long allegorical story. And once you develop the cognitive patterns that story is aimed to develop in your mind, you can then fit everything in there. And that is what Ustad Nursi uh, does in the treatise. The first section, the first episode that we did uh, on this on this treatise was the allegorical representation only. As I said, I will go ahead and read that first, and then we will try to reflect upon the following uh, section, which is about a a list of what corresponds to what uh, between the reality, the experimental reality, the reality that's out there, and the allegorical story. So, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, the merciful, the mercy giver. As you will remember, Ustad Nursi begins most of his treatises with a verse or a few verse, verses because these treatises are exegesis, interpretations of those verses. And the verses he cites at the beginning of this treatise, I will recite them. However, however, that is just one sample. Many verses of the Quran can be uh, pulled into, into the beginning of this treatise. These are all verses that point to the creation as signs of God. And the Quran is full of them, hundreds of them. Hundreds of them. In, in one of his works, uh, Imam Ghazali uh, compiles uh, close to 700, I think, of these verses out of the 6,666 uh, or so verses of the Quran. So, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of God, the merciful, the mercy giver. Washamsu wal duhaha, wal qamari iza talaha, wal nahari iza jallaha, wal layli iza yaghshaha, wal samai wa ma banaha, wal ardi wa ma tahaha. 
to the end of the uh, chapter by the sun in its morning brightness and by the moon as it follows it by the day as it displays the sun's glory and by the night as it conceals it by the sky and how he built it how god built it and by the earth and how he spread it by the soul and how he formed it god formed it these are uh, verses from the 91 91st chapter of the quran and the verses uh, 1 through 7. ey kardeş eğer hikmet alemin tılsımını ve hilkatı insanın muammasını ve hakikati salatın rumuzunu bir parça fehmetmek istersen nefsimle beraber şu temsili hikayeciye bak I'm going to read the translation now and then stop reading the Turkish and continue reading only the translation with, without much reflection uh, until the new section for today, inshallah. Oh brother, if you want to understand the secret code of the wisdom in the realm, the enigma of the human being's creation and the subtle symbolism of the reality of prayer, to some extent, consider this small representational story this allegorical story together with my lower soul once there was a sultan from the point of view of wealth he had many treasures and all sorts of jewels diamonds and emeralds in them furthermore he had hidden amazing treasures buried out of sight then in terms of perfection he had many skills in marvelous crafts and encompassing knowledge of uncountable amazing sciences. Moreover, he had the knowledge and erudite understanding of boundless fields of aesthetic knowledge. According to the secret that every possessor of beauty and perfection would like to see and show his beauty and perfection, that esteemed sultan also wanted to open an exhibit and organize this place in it so that he would expose and show the sublimity of his royal power the splendor of his treasures the wonders of his art and the marvels of his capabilities so that he would observe his metaphysical beauty and perfection in two ways this is important there are two ways for him, that sultan, to observe his metaphysical beauty and perfection. One is that he would see it himself with his discerning sight. Nothing escapes his sight. And the other is that he would behold it through the sights of others. In accordance with this wisdom, he started to build a massive, large, and magnificent palace. After he divided it into quarters and rooms, and decorated with the various embellishments of his treasures, ornamented it with the fine and most beautiful products of his crafts, organized it according to the most subtle details of the sciences of his wisdom, and equipped it with the miraculous products of the various branches of his knowledge, in that palace he opened tables containing the most delicious ones of all of his various foods and blessings he designated a table as befits the needs of each group he prepared such a generous and artful feast open to all that he spread out boundless precious blessings as if each table had come into existence as the product of a hundred subtle crafts then he invited his people and subjects from various parts of his lands for spectacle, enjoyment, and feasting. And then he informed one of his noble aides de camp about the wisdoms associated with the palace and the meanings of its furnishings, and he appointed him as a teaching master and guide, so that he, that teaching master, would describe the maker of the palace to the people using its furnishings make known the subtle symbolisms of the palace's engravings teach the allusions associated with the arts in it 
describe what the well-ordered embellishments and proportionate engravings are and from what point of view they indicate the perfections and skills of the owner of the palace to those who enter the palace. Make known the etiquette of entrance and procedures of spectacle and describe the procedures of the protocol of being in that unseen sultan's presence as it pleases him. Of course, those who are listening will understand that this points to the Prophet I want to read this paragraph one more time with that in mind. I want everybody to try to pay attention to the functions that Ustad Nursi sees in the messengerhood of the Prophet All Prophets, all Prophets, but in its perfect uh, version, in its perfect example it is the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. and then he informed one of his noble aides de camp about the wisdoms associated with the palace and the meanings of its furnishings and he appointed him as a teaching master and guide so that he would describe the messenger aide de camp would describe the maker of the palace to the people using its furnishings make known the subtle symbolism of the palace's engravings teach the allusions associated with the arts in it describe what the well-ordered embellishments and proportionate engravings are and from what point of view they indicate the perfections and skills of the owner of the palace to those who enter the palace make known the etiquette of entrance and the procedures of spectacle and describe the procedures of the protocol of being in that unseen sultan's presence as it pleases him as it pleases the sultan now the teaching master has an assistant in each quarter of the palace he takes residence in the largest quarter among his disciples and he is making his promulgation to the spectators he is saying what is he saying? O oh, people, by making this palace and exposing these things, our master, who is the king of this palace, wants to introduce himself to you. You too recognize him and try to get to know him well. He wants to endear himself to you, make himself beloved to you with these ornaments you too endear yourselves to him by appreciating his art and admiring his works he is showing his love for you with these bestowals that you see you too love him in a state of obedience he is showing his compassion and mercy to you with these visible blessings and favors you too show respect to him with gratitude he wants to show his metaphysical beauty to you with these products of his perfections. You too show your yearning to see him and earn his regard. By putting a peculiar stamp, a special seal and an inimitable monogram on all of these artifacts and ornaments that you see, he wants to show that everything belongs exclusively to him that everything is the product of his own hand that he is one and single and that he possesses independence and individuality you too recognize accept him to be one single and unique without likeness and peerless he said many other things like this that become him and his stations to the spectators and then the people who entered the palace separated into two groups. The first group, because these had recognized their selves, and this is important, recognizing oneself, that is a key to understanding everything, knowing oneself. Because these had recognized their selves, they were in possession of their intellects and their hearts were in the right place. As they beheld the amazing things in the palace, they said, There is a great matter in this. 
They also understood that it was not futile. It is not an ordinary plaything. They became curious as a result. As they were saying, wonder what code opens this up. There is a secret behind us. There is an enigma. We need to crack the code to, to see what it means. This seems to be deciphered. What is the code? What is in it? And contemplating over it, suddenly they heard the speech that that teaching master was giving. They understood the keys to all secrets are with him. First, they recognized that there must be a key to this thing. There is a code here. This is this has a meaning. And suddenly they heard him that that teaching master and they understood that the keys to all secrets are with him that teaching master they went toward him and said greetings of peace be upon you oh the teaching master by rights such a magnificent palace requires a truthful and discerning teaching guide like you please let us know what our master has informed you of so the teaching master conveyed them the speeches that were mentioned before. They listened beautifully, accepted well, and received complete benefit. They acted within the circle of what pleases the king. Because the king liked their well-mannered behaviors and states, he invited them to a special lofty and indescribable palace and showed them his bestowals there. He showered them with his favors in a way that becomes such a generous monarch, worthy of such obedient people, that is suitable for such well-mannered guests, and that befits such a lofty palace. He made them continually felicitous. He gave them felicity, and that felicity lasted, continued, on and on. As for the second group, because their intellects had corrupted, and hearts had extinguished upon entering the palace they were overcome by their lower souls and did not pay attention to anything other than the delicious foods they closed their eyes to all beautiful things and plugged their ears to the rightful guidance of the teaching master and the warnings of his disciples they ate like animals and went to sleep they drank from some undrinkable potions that were prepared for some specific purposes. Becoming drunk, they screamed, acted up, and disturbed the guest spectators exceedingly. They showed ill-mannered disrespect to the rules of the esteemed artful maker. Thus, the soldiers of the owner of the palace arrested them and threw them in a jail that becomes such ill-mannered people. So this is where we left and inshallah we will continue from the next sentence. Ey benimle bu hikayeyi dinleyen arkadaş. Oh my friend who has been listening to this story with me. And of course, once again we will remind ourselves Ustad Nursi is addressing his own lower soul, his self. And we too need to do the same thing. We too need to read it as if it is being addressed directly to each and every one of us, to our lower souls, so that we can benefit from it. Oh, my friend, who has been listening to this story with me? Elbette anladın ki, o hakimi zişan, bu kasrı şu meskür maksatlar için bina etmiştir. Şu maksatların husulü ise iki şeye mütevakkıftır. Of course, you have understood that that esteemed ruler has built this palace for these purposes that are mentioned and the realization of those purposes depend on two things so we said the king as every possessor of beauty and perfection wants to wills to uh, show his beauty and perfection wanted to do that willed to do that and created all this palace and he wants to see his beauty and perfection in two ways. One is through his own discerning eyes and 
the creation of the realm, the creation of the palace, was sufficient for that purpose. But he also wanted to see it through the sight of others who have the ability to see and appreciate. And therefore he invited guests. So the, these are the purposes of the creation right, of this palace, the, the construction of this palace. And the materialization of those purposes, for the purposes to be fulfilled, we need two things. Two things. What are they? Birisi şu gördüğümüz ve notkunu işittiğimiz üstadın vücududur. One is the existence of this teaching master, whom we see and whose speech we hear. Think of the entire palace, everything, all the furnishings, all the apartments, all the rooms, all the guests, all the food that is prepared in it, everything, everything. The fulfillment of the function, materialization, realization of the purpose of everything in there depends on what? The existence of this teaching master. Why? Because, again, there are two ways that the... the king wants to see things one is through his own discerning eye and for that we don't need a teaching master but second through the sight of those who know how to see and appreciate for the guests to know how to see and appreciate they need a teaching master çünkü o bulunmazsa bütün maksatlar beyhude olur çünkü anlaşılmaz bir kitap muallimsiz olsa manasız bir kağıttan ibaret kalır because in his absence all purposes would become useless, futile, vain. And this is because if an unintelligible book is left without a teacher, it would be reduced to meaningless paper. Imagine you found a scroll written 5,000 years ago. You found this scroll written in an alphabet that nobody knows today, written in a language that nobody knows today. Everything is forgotten. How will you make sense of it? It is just paper, or if it is maybe it was written in on you know leather, it is just leather. But what does it mean? You don't know the meaning, you don't have the code. However, if there were one person, one person who still knew that language and who could still read that language, you could take the scroll to that person, and that person would read it, and you would then understand the meanings in it. But in the absence of that teaching master. In the absence of that person who knows how to read this, who knows the code, it will be reduced to meaningless paper. İkincisi, ahali o üstadın sözünü kabul edip dinlemesidir. The second is that the people accept and listen to that teacher's words. Yes, the teaching master knows the purposes, knows the code, and he is promulgating it, he is delivering it. But... What happens if nobody listens to it? Nobody accepts that he is the teaching master sent by the king and he is the one who knows the code. They need to acknowledge that. They need to go to him and listen to what he is saying and then follow what he is saying too. Listen to and heed what he is saying. Demek vücudu üstad vücudu kasrın daisidir ve ahalinin istimaı kasrın bekasına sebeptir. Öyle ise denilebilir ki, eğer şu üstad olmasaydı, o meliki zişan şu kasrı bina etmezdi. That is to say, the teaching master's existence invites the existence of the palace. The word that is translated as uh, invite here is da'i. It is from the same root as the word dua, which is supplication. Right? that teaching master's existence is in a sense like a supplication like a prayer like a request to or from the king for him to create this palace it invites it it brings the existence of the palace without it the palace will be meaningless therefore the king would not build the palace that, uh, that is to say, the teaching master's existence invites the existence of the palace. Ve ahalinin istimağı kasrın bekasına sebeptir. And that the people listen is the cause for the palace to last. Now, it is created, it is built. The, uh, the king built the palace and the, the Eida Comp, the teaching master, is here teaching, promulgating the code. But nobody is listening. 
the purpose is not being fulfilled why should then the king continue to sustain the palace he would just destroy it it's not fulfilling the function or he would perhaps just expel the guests from the palace and that the people listen is the cause for the palace to last in that case it can be said that if it were not for that teaching master that esteemed king would not have built this palace and of course here we remember the uh, hadith qudsi uh, it is sacred hadith hadith sacred uh, tradition narrated from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam some say that it is not a, a tradition that's a debatable matter uh, whether true or not the meaning of it is true and the, that the meaning of it is true is proven here and the hadith is lawlaka lawlaka lama khalaqtu laflak oh my beloved oh this is an address to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam if it were not for you if it were not for you i would not have created the words i would not have created the realms in that case it can be said that if it were not for that teaching master that esteemed king would not have built this palace hem yine denilebilir ki o üstadın talimatını ahali dinlemedikleri vakit elbette o kasr tebdil ve tahvil edilecek and it can also be said that when the people do not listen to that teaching master's instructions of course the palace will be replaced and transformed and again according to some traditions we know that before the judgment day right before the you know doomsday when everything is destroyed there will be no believers left on this earth if there are no believers left on this earth or in this in this cosmos then the cosmos is not fully fulfilling its function so it's it's pointless at that point a arkadaş Hikaye burada bitti. Eğer şu temsilin sırrını anladınsa bak hakikatin yüzünde gör. Oh friend, the story ended here. If you understood the secret of this allegory, this representational story, look, see the face of reality too. So here, as Ustad Nursi said, the, the story came to an end. And as it is his custom, uh, those who, uh, for instance, listen to the uh, tenth word, the, the many many episodes of the tenth word or earlier episodes to the first through eighth words uh, this is start nurse's customs he he provides us with an allegorical story that helps us understand the patterns of some connections between things a cognitive pattern and then although a re, a reality the meaning of a reality might be difficult to grasp by using that pattern, we see what in the reality fits into what in the allegorical pattern, and we we, we grasp the reality. It is a an instrument. It's a tool that facilitates uh, our understanding of reality, right? And it is not a complete uh, made-up story either, because it is parallel to reality itself. So it is not like a metaphor in the sense that the metaphor and the reality have nothing in common other than that the, the metaphor uh, evokes some thought in the mind when we say for instance she has a golden heart we don't mean that her heart is made of gold the as a metal right gold is precious and her heart is precious and we attribute value to a heart to the extent that it is merciful good compassionate and so on and so forth therefore when we say she has a golden heart we mean that she is compassionate she is good and so on and so forth Ustad Nursi's uh, allegorical stories in in most cases are not like this they are rather what uh, linguists call they are rather like what linguists call a metonymy uh, which means that there is a connection between the the metaphorical word and the reality that it is representing if there is a continuity for instance Ustad Nursi gives an example for this uh, in the old days the Arabs would say he has a long sword sword belt or a long sheath if they wanted to 
indicate that a person was tall because a tall person can carry a sword with a long sword belt or, or a long sheath right so the person in in reality can have a long sword belt and also be tall right but a person's heart cannot be made of gold that's not possible so in the metonymy the meaning of the the word that is used to represent something does not have to disappear there is still a reality to it it is it is even the story is truthful and it is very important to understand and grasp the story the the allegory first so that we can understand the reality that it represents in a better way inshallah so oh friend the story ended here if you understood the secret of this allegory look see the face of reality too işte o saray şu alemdir ki tavanı tebessüm eden yıldızlarla tenvir edilmiş gökyüzüdür so that palace is this realm whose ceiling is the sky illuminated by smiling stars or illuminated with smiling stars why smiling stars this is one of Ustad Nursi's metaphors he thinks of let's say a beautiful flower he went out uh, on a spring day he is taking a walk and he turned his head and saw this beautiful flower let's say on a in a wild rose bush it is created by God and it is created by God for you to see you when it was being created it was destined for you to see so this is your Lord giving a favor to you bestowing a blessing to you it is as if your Lord is smiling to you showing his love kindness compassion to you when we smile when we smile we indicate certain emotions certain meanings so it is as if when you turn and see this beautiful flower your Lord is indicating those beautiful meanings for you therefore it's as if the flower is a smiling image before you a same same thing for the stars on a clear night when we turn and look at the sky on a clear night when we turn and look at the firmament and without light pollution and so on and so forth we see a beautiful imagery our hearts our spirits are elated filled with joy and and we are built with that sense that aesthetic sense that knows how to appreciate beauty and we are filled with appreciation right those stars are like smiling objects images so that palace is this realm whose ceiling is the sky illuminated by smiling stars tabanı ise Sharktan garba guna gun çiçeklerle süslendirilmiş yeryüzüdür. Its floor is the face of the earth that is adorned by all sorts of flowers from east to west. Imagine how many different kinds of flowers are there out there and how each flower is slightly different from another. How many manifestations of beauty are presented before us in this in this palace how beautifully the floor is ornamented o melik ise ezel ebed sultanı olan bir zatı mukaddestir ki yedi kat semavat ve arz ve içlerinde olan her şey kendilerine mahsus lisanlarla o zatı takdis edip tesbih ediyorlar as for that king so this is probably the most important part of the uh, the matter right as for that king he is a sanctified entity who is the sultan of pre-eternity and post-eternity we are now trying to grasp the majesty of that king a sanctified entity there are, there is nothing that can be categorized as defect or deficiency or fault that we can attribute to him he is above and beyond all of that he is in his entity he is above and beyond our complete comprehension too 
but we can have an understanding of him as he manifests himself through his names and attributes. He is a sanctified entity who is the sultan of pre-eternity and post-eternity. He is the creator of time and he was the king before time existed. He will continue to be the king. There is no end to his kingdom. That he is such a sanctified entity that seven layers of the heavens, the earth, and everything in them sanctify and glorify that entity with their peculiar tongues. There's nothing in the creation that does not glorify him with praise. The little net that might be flying in the room that you may not even be able to notice unless you pay close attention and wow, it is there. That net is sanctifying and glorifying God. There might be a germ living on the wings of that net. You may not see without a microscope. If you put it under a microscope, you will see that microbe, that germ is sanctifying and glorifying God. There might be atoms, molecules that made up that germ. You may not see them unless you put them on, under an electron microscope. And even then, there, it might be difficult to see them, but there are other ways to know that it is there. That molecule and the atoms in it and the particles that are smaller than atoms and the particles that are smaller than those particles. However long it goes, we do not know the end of it yet. Each one of them are sanctifying and glorifying God. And from that net, move on to whales in the oceans, dinosaurs that once walked the earth, to the planets, to the stars, to the clusters of stars, to galaxies, to the entire cosmos. Everything, each and everything, one by one and all together, are sanctifying and glorifying their Lord. How? many ways many ways they are manifesting his names and attributes the net when it was hungry it found a little drop of maybe sugar a drop of fruit juice somewhere and just ate from it it manifested god's name a razak the provider that net that's flying in the air it is live it is moving it is growing it's reproducing it is manifesting God's name, Al Hay, Al Qayyum, Al Yahi, the the living, the sustainer, the giver of life. Everything is sanctifying and glorifying their Lord, and everything is glorifying Him by obeying Him, by being in a state of obedience, not moving an inch. What an inch! Not moving a thousandth of an inch, not moving a billionth of an inch, not moving at all from the straight line that they are put onto, from their orbit, from their function that they were created to fulfill. Everything in the creation is obeying the Lord of everything by fulfilling their functions fully and completely and perfectly. That's why they are created. That's how they are created. It is in their nature, given nature. Except, except for human beings who are also given, and the jinn, who are also given partial uh, volition, partial will, and sometimes they don't fulfill. And that's a, that's a, that's that has benefits. That has there's a wisdom in that too. That is how we become the spectators who appreciate, because being able to appreciate requires being able to not appreciate. You have to have a choice. Hem öyle bir meliki kadirdir ki semavat ve arzı altı günde yaratarak arş-ı rububiyetinde durup gece ve gündüzü siyah ve beyaz iki hat gibi birbiri arkası sıra döndürüp 
Kainat sahifesinde ayatını yazan ve güneş, ay, yıldızlar emrine musahhar, zi haşmet ve zi kudret sahibidir. Such an all-powerful king that having created the heavens and the earth in six days. And of course this is from the Quran. God says in the Quran that he created the heavens and the earth in six days. And of course we do not understand that as, that as six 24-hour time periods because the definition of a day can change from place to place, time to time. And God says in the Quran that in by him there are days that are 50,000 days or years by our calculation. There are days that are... So this is a relative term. In Perhaps in six stages may be a way to understand it. But we don't have to go there. This is clear. We know that that's not what God means. God does not mean six 24-hour time periods he created it in stages or whatever he meant sometimes with expressions like this we just say we take and believe it as god willed it and then we defer the reality of it to our lord and we ask him to illuminate our hearts such an all-powerful king that having created the heavens and the earth in six days then stood on the throne of his lordship Ar-Rahman al al This is from the Quran too. And the word stood here is of course used metaphorically. We don't know what exactly it means. But the throne of his lordship is where he is manifest with his, all his glory and majesty. And it is, as far as we can tell, the greatest thing in the creation that contains everything in the creation. The world compared to his God's footstool, the kursi, the entire cosmos compared to it, is like a ring throw in, thrown into the desert. And the footstool compared to his arsh, his throne, that there is no comparison. It needs to bring these senses of awe and majesty and glory as attributed to our Lord, to our, to our hearts. Such an all-powerful king that, having created the heavens and the earth in six days, then stood on the throne of his lordship, and by alternating night and day, one after the other, like two threads, one black and one white, again an imagery from the Quran, he writes his signs on the page of the cosmos. The cosmos, the creation, is like a book with pages. And... There are signs, there are, there are words written on it. And each thing in the creation is written, written with the pen of power of our Lord. And they have meanings. We need to try to read those meanings. We need to try to read the cosmos, the creation as a book of meanings. And of course, it is the Quran that guides us to the true meanings of those meanings. The sun, the moon and the stars are subjugated to his command. So from our point of view, the sun is such a big thing. It is so big that you can fit thousands and thousands of earths in it. The moon that is so big is like it is like continents on earth. Can you imagine moving such a big thing around? What is the biggest thing that we can move around in this on this earth? They um, they some, sometimes put some like wheels on, on their buildings and somehow prop them up and move buildings from one place to another. Perhaps that is it. But imagine moving continents from place to place. Imagine moving the moon on a specific orbit continually for millions of years, billions of years, and not letting it move an inch out of its orbit. The sun, the moon, and the stars are subjugated to his command, and he has the possession of sublimity and power. He is sublime, and his, his, his power is absolute. There is no, no limit to his power. That is the Lord. That is the king. This is the palace. That is the king. We need to fill ourselves, we need to close our eyes and contemplate this, reflect upon it, and fill our hearts with, with, his, with his oh, and with love for him. 
he is majestic and he is beautiful and then let's continue reading the the the story and what it corresponds to in reality o sarayın menzilleri ise şu 18 bin alemdir ki her birisi kendine layık bir tarzla tezyin ve tanzim edilmiştir so we first um tried to establish his majesty and glory and now we are moving on to his mercy compassion and and beauty we we uh, know that god has many names and our scholars have classified those names as majestic names and beautiful names and then from the combination of majesty and beauty at the same time their their simultaneous manifestation emerges perfection and there are names of perfection as for the rooms of that palace they are these 18000 realms that are each decorated and put in order as befits it 18000 realms we see one of them they can be one you know concentric they can be uh, together in the same space space may not be applying to some of them time may not be applying to some of them uh, we know again this from narrations 18000 realms each one of them each one of them is decorated and put in order organized in a way that befits it its function its needs its capacities think of the king who created all those rooms all those apartments in this palace like a display and created a different beauty a different organization a different indication manifestation of majesty a different wonder and amazing thing in each room in each apartment and then room of the palace işte o sarayda gördüğün sanayi garibe ise şu alemde görünen kudret ilahiyenin mucizeleridir see the marvelous arts you see in that palace are the miracles of divine power that are visible in this realm we said everything we we see around right they are signs of creation they are signs of our lord from the point of view of the meanings that they manifest from the names and attributes of our lord and they are also miracles of his power his divine power now when we think of miracles we usually think of and that justifiably so we usually think of uh, the breaking of the norm and then that would be a prophetic miracle that God gives to his prophets in order to affirm that they are his uh, his prof- prophets it can be saintly miracles that God bestows uh, as gifts to his beloved friends saints and then it can it can be that are given to people who are really off the path who are really misguided and there's no hope that they will come back and they deserve to be sunk deeper and deeper and God sinks them deeper and deeper by giving them these breakings of the norm these miracles that so that they think that they are wow they are something so there are many different kinds of miracles and again the shared aspect between them is that it is the breaking of the norm what is the norm for instance if you drop an apple it falls or a human being has a certain mass and therefore can walk the earth but cannot fly but then the norm is broken and you see a person who's flying it is possible it is possible now why is the breaking of the norm possible because the one who is breaking is the one who instituted the norm who ordained the norm so therefore the miracle the breaking of the norm is an indication of his power and and then what is the norm the norm is an indication of his power too the norm is in place because he wills and acts upon it and that is a manifestation of his power see the marvelous arts you see in that palace are the miracles of divine power that are visible in this realm ve o sarayda gördüğün taamlar ise şu alemde hele yaz mevsiminde hele barla bahçelerinde rahmeti ilahiyenin semeratı harikalarına işarettir as for the foods various items of food you saw in that palace they point to the wondrous fruits of divine mercy in this realm especially in the season of summer and especially in the orchards of barla 
And of course, when Ustad Nursi is writing these treatises, he's in this village called Barla that is uh, in southwest Turkey. He was exiled to there. Uh, this was a really distant village. You had to climb a mountain and then cross a lake and then climb a little bit more and then you would come to this village. But it was beautiful. And it was a feast for, you know, the inhabitants of the place in the summer when they went out and, you know, walked through the orchards and saw these beautiful fruits, apricots, apples and whatnot. Ustad Nursi is reading the cosmos. Ustad Nursi is reading the creation. He reads the creation. And then this is the outcome. What we are reading here, what we are trying to reflect upon is the outcome of him reading the creation under the guidance of the Quran and under the guidance of the Prophet The foods then are what? They are wondrous fruits of divine mercy. Divine mercy. Why divine mercy? Well, they are, you know, products of power too, and, you know, they are signs of creation. But especially when it comes to food, they are products of divine mercy because they are instruments of provision, and provision shines behind the window of mercy. Mercy is to recognize that something or somebody is in need and to run to its assistance, to meet its needs you run to its assistance when we say rahmaniya that is god's mercy for the entire creation everything together when we say rahimiya that is god's mercy that is concentrated on each and everything so there is rahmani and rahimiya both kinds of mercy on all food items because all food items are created for the needs of all those who get hungry for all those who uh, need nutrition in order to sustain themselves and then each one of them is designated for an individual hungry person or thing an individual needy animal an individual human being there is mercy in it it is a it is an indication it's a fruit of divine mercy ve oradaki ocak ve matbaa ise burada kalbinde ateş olan arz ve sathı arzdır as for the hearth and kitchen over there because the palace has a hearth a kitchen where you know food is prepared and then it is served to the uh, guests who are invited for a feast the hearth of that palace and its kitchen here it is the earth with fire in its heart earth has fire in its heart and you can also think about the the sun that is sending its rays and those rays are being converted to heat here right it is the earth with fire in its heart and the surface of the earth every tree is like a cauldron in which food is being boiled and then prepared and then imagine a you know apricot tree it is like a cauldron in which apricot is being cooked every squash plant is like a stove on which the squash is being prepared and cooked every animal that is halal that is permissible to eat is like that too there is one who is preparing all this food for us and it is being done on the surface of this earth. Therefore, the surface of the earth is like a kitchen. There is preparation, there is cooking going on all around. And that is a fruit of mercy. That is a sign. That is a manifestation of mercy. Ve orada temsilde gördüğün gizli definelerin cevherleri ise şu hakikatte esma-i kutsi ilahiyenin cilvelerine misaldir. And as for the jewels of the hidden buried treasures you saw in the allegory, they are examples of the reflections of holy divine names in this reality. They are examples of the reflections of holy divine names in this reality. Why buried? Why not just treasure, but buried treasures, right? Because we need to figure out how to dig them up. They are everywhere wherever you scratch the surface it is under it but you need to scratch the surface and look beneath the apparent physical substance to see the meaning that is manifest from the names and attributes of your lord from the names and attributes of our lord the apple as a physical object is some carbon some vitamins some water some molecules all that's it but 
There is taste in it. There is nutrition in it. There is an appealing quality to its appearance. And all of these are meanings that manifest the Lord, the merciful Lord, the beautiful Lord, the provider Lord, the powerful Lord. They manifest God. And therefore, everywhere, everywhere it is filled with these jewels. Whoever finds them, finds a big thing. He finds a way to know his Lord. By seeing the beauty in the apple, one knows, sees, witnesses, and appreciates his Lord's beauty. And that is the purpose of creation. And because this person fulfills his function in the creation, then he earns eternal bliss in paradise. What a precious jewel that is. What a precious jewel that is. We want to accumulate as many of those jewels as possible. We want to reflect upon the creation, scratch the surface and unearth jewels and collect them. We, we want to have a big chest of jewels when we go before our Lord. That will have big currency. Those jewels will have big currency there before our Lord. Ve temsilde gördüğümüz nakışlar ve o nakışların remizleri ise şu alemi süslendiren muntazam masnuat ve mevzun nukuşu kalemi kudrettir ki Kadir Zülcelal'in esmasına delalet ederler. As for the engravings we saw in the allegory and the insignia on them, the insignia signifying the allusions associated with them, they are the orderly artifacts and proportionate engravings of the pen of power that indicate the names of the majestic all-powerful one. Now what is the difference between reflection and engraving? Uh, these are metaphors that Ustad Nursi uses in order to help us understand these realities. The reality is that apple is, you know, from one point of view, that physical object, but from the point of view of reality, it is a manifestation of God's names and attributes. And therefore the reality of all things in, in existence are the names. And the reflection is how those are manifest. However, when we look around and think about this manifestation, we see that, let's say, a rose is beautiful, but a, a you know, chamomile is also beautiful, and a cherry flower is also beautiful. And they're all beautiful flowers, and they're all manifesting the name beauty. But then, what that tells us is that this beauty is unlimited. It has unlimited capacity to manifest and all these things that we see are variations of its reflections so in Ustad Nursi's terminology those variations are nukush naqsh engravings and the palace is full of engravings wherever you turn you see those engravings right as for the engravings we saw in the allegory and the insignia on them so they are engravings and those have meanings they point to something subtly they point to something very subtly sometimes not one but many names are manifest on a created artifact and the difference between one artifact and the other is the outcome of the combination of different names and therefore there are indications as to the interaction of those names on, on, on those created beings, on those artifacts. So those are uh, engravings that have subtle indications. They are the orderly artifacts and proportionate engravings. So there's nothing random in them. They are orderly and proportionate. They are meant, right? They are meant, they are willed by someone who knows what he is doing with a wisdom of the pen of power that indicate the names of the majestic all-powerful one majestic he is majestic when I mean, you, you cannot look at this cosmos and think about these things the flower and the star and see how that beauty fills everywhere and not think that this beauty is majestic 
and there you see perfection because beauty is manifest behind the window of majesty and majesty is manif manifest behind the window of beauty and there you see perfection ve o üstad ise seyyidimiz Muhammed aleyhissalatu vesselamdır avanesi ise enbiya aleyhisselamdır ve şakirtleri ise evliya ve asfiyadır as for that teaching master he is our master Muhammad blessings and greetings of peace be upon him and of course we noticed this before who else could that be who else could that honored honorable aide de camp who is teaching the people who is promulgating the message the instructions of the king who is showing the people the codes that break the deciphered meanings in the palace and who enabled them to read everything as what they mean who else could that be the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa ashabihi wa sallam as for his assistants they are the prophets all the prophets greetings of peace be upon them now how can the prophets be assistants of prophet muhammad they came before him well first uh prophet muhammad وسلم, had the most complete and perfect message that god sent down to creation sent to creation and all other prophets who carried parts and versions of that message did so in the light of the path that prophet muhammad وسلم, opened up with his light his light was the first thing that was ever created and light is that which when applied makes that which is not apparent apparent the physical light the, the photons that we see is an example a version of that we don't know the nature the quiddity of what that light that was first created exactly is but we know that it was the light of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that was first created and the importance of that light is that that light is what makes everything apparent in this creation that light is what makes the meanings of created beings apparent that light is what makes the beauty of created me uh, beings apparent in this creation without that light nothing would have meaning and all prophets are pointing to the meanings that are in the creation therefore they are moving they are fulfilling their functions under in his light they are basking in the light of that sun of prophethood and they are his assistants in this sense and also in the sense that each and every one of them when they came told their communities told their followers that there would be a last prophet a last messenger to come and he would have the perfect most complete deen religion message from the lord and therefore they each affirmed his prophethood his messengerhood his message as for his disciples they are the saints and purified ones as for his disciples they are the saints friends of god those who are given a special station in the presence of their lord those who are drawn close to god and the purified ones and that's also important the purified ones are those who understand god's message as sent to his prophet in its purest its simplest form without any you know convoluted rational questions and so on but the, their hearts just absorb the message and accept it and they are they are satisfied with it they don't need any further explanation any further questioning and so on and so forth they are satisfied they are content with the message that is sent from god that's sent by god through jibreel alayhi salam through the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to all human beings and the jinn their hearts are pure right and ustad nursi somewhere says that there would be millions of uh, saints and billions of asfiyah inshallah each and every believer 
um, may may each and every believer be among those asfia we may not be able to attain that degree of sainthood perhaps we do we don't know god knows those who have attained sainthood and the, their sainthood may be hidden from themselves and the saints of god may be hidden among the people maybe maybe be among them but there are more asfia and and maybe be among the asfia too inshallah his disciples, the disciples of the Prophet وسلم, are the saints and purified ones. The one difference of the saints is that they are also like guideposts. They are given mirac miracles sometimes. They are given miracles. They are given gnosis, knowledge. They are given uh, the, the capacity to be an example for others. And therefore we turn to them. We ask God to guide us to them, to enable us to benefit from the light that emanates from those light posts. But in addition to that, there are the Asfiya, and the Asfiya are, according to Ustad Nursi's understanding, many more than the saints. Those who purely absorb the message, those are the Asfiya. Okay, this uh, keeps going on. There are many aspects to reality and inshallah we will go over all of that, but it looks like time is over. So we will stop here and continue in the next episode, uh, inshallah. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana innaka anta al-alimul hakim wa akhir dawahum anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen al-fatiha.